Hi, Dr. Bredesen, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me okay? We can, thank great. you. Great, and can you see the slides all right? We see your slides just great. I know you're uh, uh, pulling them all up after the, the Fantastic. slides. Fantastic, there we go. All right, thank well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, very exciting stuff. I think this is a really interesting time because we are seeing, as I'll show you today, reversals in patients with cognitive decline, something that uh, has been a goal for many, many years and which hasn't been described before. We published the first results back in 2014, and we've actually just finished the first trial. And I'll talk a little bit about the trial uh, with very exciting results. So for the first time, we can not only prevent, but also reverse cognitive decline. Okay. So uh, the problem here has been that um, there is, a, we've all been through this pandemic uh, over the last uh, year plus, uh, but just for comparison here, the, there we go, COVID-19 has, has killed uh, over 500,000 people. Uh, but for comparison, Alzheimer's of the currently living Americans, those of us living today, uh, Alzheimer's will lead to the death in nearly 100 times. About 45 million of the currently living Americans will die from Alzheimer's disease if we don't develop an effective prevention and treatment. So this is a major, major issue. And so the problem is that COVID-19 is a simple disease. So just like pneumococcal pneumonia, we know what causes it. There's an organism. We can develop antivirals for it. We can develop improvements for our immune system. We can develop all sorts of ways to go at this because we have it sequenced. We know what it is. Yes, it's still a pandemic. Yes, it's still a problem. But fundamentally, Alzheimer's is quite different. There is no agreement on what Alzheimer's actually is in terms of the cause. Is this due to a virus? Is this due to a change in your immune system? Is this due to so-called type three diabetes? Is this a prion disease? Is this a disease due to amyloid, due to misfolded proteins? And so there has been pretty much uniform failure in going after this disease and over 400 failed clinical trials at a cost of billions of dollars. So this is the issue that we've been wrestling with for 30 years now in the laboratory. The goal of our laboratory over the last 30 years has been to understand the phenomenon of neurodegeneration at a fundamental enough level that we can begin to, to fashion the first effective treatments. And that's been the problem. There have been over 150,000 papers published on Alzheimer's disease. We've actually published over 200 ourselves. Uh, and yet there hasn't been a general understanding of what's actually doing this. And therefore there hasn't been a good ability to predict therapeutic success and failure accurately. So people have gone off and spent billions on these trials that have been virtually uniform failures. And here's why. So I think as everyone's aware here, there is a real revolution going on in medicine. I mean, that is the real truth. That's the exciting part. If you look at simple diseases, and these are the things that were killing us 100 years ago, things like tuberculosis, pneumococcal pneumonia, diphtheria, things like that, then they share one thing in common. That is to say that there are lots of things that can increase your risk, but there's one thing that's by far more important than anything else. So let's look at pneumococcal pneumonia as a simple example. You have an increased risk for pneumococcal pneumonia if you have alcohol on board, if you've got diabetes mellitus, if you've got B cell problems. So for example, people with multiple myeloma, and there are many other things that increase your risk for getting pneumococcal pneumonia, airway changes, all sorts of things, previous damage to your lungs, things like that. But the pneumococcus itself is so much more important. It outstrips everything so much that we as physicians have gotten away with treating this illness just by targeting one thing, which in this case, of course, is the pneumococcus. So whether it's with amoxicillin or penicillin or cephalosporins or what have you, we're able to cure the vast majority of people who have pneumococcal pneumonia just by targeting that one thing. The problem is now in the 21st century, virtually all of us are dying from fundamentally different diseases. These are complex chronic illnesses, Alzheimer's, cancers, cardiovascular disease, renal failure, other inflammatory diseases, and so forth and so on. 
And the problem with these diseases is that you can see here, taking Alzheimer's as an example, insulin resistance here is one of the things that's critical. Pathogens, very common. Uh, for example, herpes simplex from the lip, uh, T. denticola or P. gingivalis from the oral microbiome. There, and there are other organisms, chronic mold exposure from sinuses, for example, Borrelia systemically, and on and on. So all of these are potentially important in increasing risk for Alzheimer's disease. NF-kappa B, so anything that activates the inflammatory state, be it leaky gut, be it exposure to specific pathogens, be it exposure to things that you're hypersensitive to, anything that increases that molecule, NF-kappa B, actually increases your risk for Alzheimer's disease. And then various toxins, uh, for example, mercury. So people who have mercury exposure are at increased risk. And in fact, you can actually show that in, in the laboratory that just taking mercury itself will induce the same changes in the brain that you see with Alzheimer's, the same amyloid, the same tau. So mercury, another one. And then mycotoxins, people who are exposed to these mold-produced toxins and other biotoxins have an increased risk for cognitive decline of Alzheimer's disease. And then people who are exposed to organic toxins, people, things like, uh, things like um, benzene, toluene, glyphosate, all of these things increase risk. And then people who have high homocysteine, so people who are poor methylators, for example, or who are poor in their overall consumption of B12, uh, folate, and pyridoxine, all of these increase. And then there are many other players here. But you can see here that unlike with a simple disease like pneumococcal pneumonia, there's not one of these that we can go after with a simple prescription and then we'll cure the whole thing. And this has been the problem. And so people have go, tried to go after Alzheimer's with these simple prescriptions and it simply has not worked. So this is a fundamentally different type of illness. We need to take a precision protocol approach. We need to evaluate these various variables with each patient. And then we need to target the ones that are suboptimal for each person. And as I'll show you, that's exactly what has worked. So if you look then at the drug development over the last several years, it's really been a very sad story. We call this Game of Thrones because they've thrown away a tremendous amount of money to develop these drugs that actually haven't worked particularly well. So this is a, the area of greatest biomedical therapeutic failure. As people say, everyone knows a cancer survivor, no one knows an Alzheimer's survivor or an ALS survivor or a frontotemporal dementia survivor. So this area of neurodegeneration has been the area of greatest biomedical therapeutic failure. And if you just look at a few of these, uh, here you can see, for example, semigasostat is an example where Eli Lilly spent over $500 million developing and testing semigasostat. Um, this affected uh, gamma secretase in, in the production of A-beta. And unfortunately, not only did semigasostat not make Alzheimer's better, it actually made it worse. So it was worse than doing nothing. So this is, you know, again, when this, these sorts of things are happening, there's something missing from the understanding of this disease. Here's another one, Dimabon. It failed the first trial and then they didn't believe it and said, well, wait a minute, we're gonna try it again. It was then tried with Aricept. And in fact, the two of them together also did not work. So again, there's something fundamentally wrong when we have billions of dollars spent in over 400 failed trials. So if you look at the theories and ask what is actually driving this problem, how does it work? Why do you get Alzheimer's and why has it been so difficult to treat? We need a model, a model that we can, that will tell us this is what this disease is, just as we have for COVID-19. We actually have, of course, we have a sequence of its RNA so we can say, okay, here's the problem, here's what it's actually doing. With Alzheimer's, we don't have that. So the dominant theory over the last couple of decades has been the amyloid cascade theory that led various drug companies to develop antibodies to remove the amyloid. And unfortunately, these have not worked. The one that has been claimed as a major success did not improve people, did not stabilize, but it actually slowed the decline by about a third. That's the best it has done. And that increased the value uh, of its parent company, Eli Lilly, by $20 billion in one day when this was announced. 
And unfortunately, as you can see, it actually doesn't help people, it doesn't make them better. So there are other people who believe that this is a disease of tau, this which is a microtubule stabilizing protein. There are others who believe that this is a prion disease, that is to say, uh, infectious agents that beget more of themselves in the absence of nucleic acid, so proteinaceous infectious uh, agents that were first discovered uh, by Dr. Stan Prusner, who won the Nobel Prize for this work, for this discovery in 1997. Type 3 diabetes, there's a lot of interest in the idea that Alzheimer's may represent type 3 diabetes. There's a lot of interest in the idea that herpes simplex, chronic recurrent herpes simplex, may be the cause of Alzheimer's. And there's actually a nice study uh, out of Taiwan showing that people who actually actively treated their outbreaks in midlife reduced, fairly markedly reduced their likelihood of developing Alzheimer's in the future. Then there's the idea that this is actually produced by P. gingivalis, which is one of the oral microbiome elements, and that the, the, it's not just that particular bacterium, but it's actually the gingipane, which is a specific protease that is produced by P. gingivalis. And so there's a whole company around the idea that we're going to get a drug against the gingipane, and that's going to cure Alzheimer's. And that's still in testing. And then this idea, as I mentioned earlier, mercury toxicity. And then the idea that this is all about metal binding by the amyloid, that you make the amyloid, it binds metals, pulls the metals out, and therefore you get toxicity. That's yet another one. And that's also been tested therapeutically without any positive results. Then there's a whole field around reactive oxygen and nitrogen species. Again, this has been tested without any success there's some very nice work out of UC San Diego showing very interestingly in the patient's brains with Alzheimer's, you actually see gene amplification of APP. So you see additional copies of APP. Again, however, that hasn't led to any effective treatment so far. Then there's another completely different theory that this is all about cortical demyelination. When you lose the small amounts of myelin, not in your white matter, but actually in your gray matter, in which there are small amounts, that that is the cause of this illness. Again, none of these has led to any successful treatment. So you can see here, there's a lot of disagreement about what this disease actually represents. And we need some sort of model if we're going to go forward, if we're going to have successful treatments, something that will predict both the positive trials and the negative trials and give us some insight into what this disease actually is. But here's the problem though, if you go into your doctor today or you go to a, an Alzheimer's center of excellence anywhere in the country, the current standard of care does not match up with the research findings. So the current standard of care is that there is one cause, we don't know what it is, that this is one disease, we call it Alzheimer's, and therefore we're gonna give you one treatment, it's a monotherapy, we're gonna write a prescription for Aricept or Namenda, we're gonna give you, it's one phase, we're not gonna change it over time, we're gonna put you on one thing, and it's ineffective. Well, obviously that's a suboptimal approach. So the research findings suggest something quite different that there are dozens of contributors, and we first published and identified 36 a number of years ago. There are a few more that we know about now, but it's about 42, 43, somewhere in there. It's not thousands, that's the good news. It's not even many hundreds. It's on the order of 50 or so, give or take a few. So therefore, when you actually look at people who have cognitive decline that will ultimately become Alzheimer's, and I should say, it takes a long time. When we, when we say that someone has Alzheimer's disease, it's like some, saying that someone has widely metastatic cancer. Before you get Alzheimer's, which occurs about 20 years after the beginning of the pathophysiology, you go through several stages. So at the beginning, when things first start, you can actually pick up changes. You can pick up changes in spinal fluid. You can pick up changes by PET scan but people are completely asymptomatic at the beginning. So you have an asymptomatic period as stage one. If you don't do something at that time, then the next stage is called SCI, subjective cognitive impairment. So at that time, you know that there's something wrong, that something's not quite right, your memory's not what it could. Some people will say they have brain fog, something is not quite right. Often your spouse will note, sometimes the people you work with may note that there's something that's changed. But when you're taking standard testing, you're still testing within the normal range. And therefore the doctors will say, no, you seem to be fine. 
Well, in fact, you're not fine and you are entering that second stage. That can last 10 years. So people go through these periods where they know that something is not right, they have SCI, and there's a tremendous amount you can do to improve that during that time. But people typically don't, they typically wait. Then you go on to the third stage, which is called MCI, mild cognitive impairment. At that point, you know there's something wrong, your spouse often knows that there's something wrong. And when you now test on neuropsychological tests, you also score uh, in, the, in the abnormal area so that you know that there's something wrong. And in fact, the tests are now finally showing it. So you can see even these tests are relatively late in determining that there's something wrong. And then finally, if you don't do, and that, that lasts a few years, 10 to 15% of, uh, of each group. So 10 to 15% of the people with MCI will convert to full-on Alzheimer's disease each year. And by definition, what that means is that you've begun to lose your activities of daily living. You may have trouble dressing yourself or you may have trouble bathing or taking care of yourself. So you can see this is a very late stage of this process. So the disease that we've thought of as a disease of our 60s, 70s, and 80s is really a disease of our 40s, 50s, 60s, and often even into our 30s but it's just diagnosed 20 years later. This is why we recommend that everybody please get a cognoscopy, get on just like you get a colonoscopy when you're 50, please get a cognoscopy when you're 45 or if you're older than 45 already, please consider that. Please get on active prevention or at least earliest reversal, do not wait. Now to go back to here the research, when you then look at people who have cognitive decline, you can now see this is not just one disease, there are subtypes here. So we see, and we'll talk about these in a few minutes, there are people who get this more because of ongoing inflammation that you've been hearing about. There are people who are getting this more because of glycotoxicity and insulin resistance. People who are getting it more because of an atrophic effect. So low hormones, low growth factors, low nutrients people who are getting it more because of active exposure to mycotoxins or organic toxins or metallotoxins, and then people who are getting it more because of a vascular, and then finally traumatic subtype. So these are the different subtypes. And therefore, no surprise, there are many different personalized programs, and therefore there are protocols. You've got to look to see why did each person develop this problem or the likelihood, the risk for the problem. And the fact of the matter is, if we all work together, we can actually make this a very rare disease, which is just what it should be. If everyone got on active prevention or earliest reversal, this would be a very rare problem. So let's drill down and look at how this actually happens to your brain. And then you can see from that how to prevent it and how to reverse it. So if you look at the master switch at the, at the crux of this whole problem, there's a very interesting molecule that's called APP, amyloid precursor protein. And we discovered in our many years of laboratory research, uh, this is essentially a master switch. And so what's happening, this is very much like having the president of your country, for example. So when times are good, you know, if you've got, uh, if you've got peace in the land and you don't have a lot of problem with pollution, you don't have a lot of inflation, things are good. APP actually senses that. So it senses hormonal status. It senses growth factor status. It senses some of the nutrients. For example, you can trace a direct pathway from estradiol. Estradiol binds to its estrogen receptor, enters the nucleus, impacts hundreds of genes. And one of the genes that it impacts does this. So it comes back and it's a molecular scissors called an alpha secretase. It cuts the APP and produces two peptides, SAPP alpha, which is outside the cell, and CTF alpha, which is inside the cell. So these are literally like memos. They're saying to, the, to your brain, things are good. Let's go ahead and make new connections, make new memories, and keep new memories. So when things are good, that's the kind of signaling you have. And there's this beautiful balance for most of your life that between that and the pulling back. Now, when things are bad or you're, you're, you're losing a memory, so 
For example, you know, all of us are forgetting the seventh song that played on the radio on the way to work yesterday. Then you have a very different scenario. And unfortunately, this happens chronically in people who are developing Alzheimer's or who have Alzheimer's. So again, let's go back to the analogy. You've got the president of your country saying, uh-oh, we've now got problems, we've got invaders. And one of the common things is that you are responding to various infections. The pathologists looking at Alzheimer's brains have identified candida, have identified molds, have identified spirochetes, have identified viruses, have identified bacteria. Um, it's a zoo. There are all sorts of different things that you can find in patients. So part of what you're doing is you are responding to this invasion just as your president would respond to an invasion of your country. So now you're saying, okay, we cannot afford to do this. And again, we can trace the direct molecular pathways if you activate NF-kappa B because you have ongoing inflammation due to an infection or due to a change in immune system. Very much like with COVID-19, you have this innate immune system activation. Then what happens? It, again, it enters the nucleus, affects hundreds of genes, and two of the ones that it affects cut here, this is called the beta secretase and the gamma secretase and produce a beta. Now, this is the thing that everyone's been trying to get rid of. This is the thing that makes the amyloid here, this a beta. But you can see it's a much bigger story than simply a beta. A beta is there trying to protect you. So there again, there's a direct analogy here with COVID-19. With COVID-19, of course, people have died from cytokine storm. You have this activation of the innate immune system, the inflammatory part, without enough adaptive response to get rid of the virus. So you undergo cytokine storm and you can die. And so people have tried to suppress that to get better outcomes. Well, with Alzheimer's, the same thing happens but you now have a chronic, instead of a cytokine storm, you have a cytokine drizzle. So you've got this chronic mild activation of your innate system without enough effectiveness of your adaptive system to get rid of these various pathogens. So you continue to make this amyloid, which is a protectant, which is, yes, it's protecting, but it's also downsizing. And if, you, if that sounds strange, this is exactly analogous to what happened to our country with the pandemic. So over a year ago, we were all told, wait a minute, we have to shelter in place. We've got a social distance. We've got a pathogen. We've got a problem here, which is SARS-CoV-2. So what happened? We all did this. We downsized. And in fact, we entered a recession. The same thing is happening in the brain of a patient with Alzheimer's. You've got ongoing insults. You are responding by protecting yourself by making these four peptides here, SAPP beta, A beta, JCASP, and C31. But part of that protection is a downsizing of the brain. So you are producing this stuff that is going out and trying to kill these various pathogens, but at the same time, it's also downsizing your brain. So we need to understand for each patient what is causing that problem. So there is a balance, as you can see here, between this side, which is the synaptoblastic side, making, keeping synapses, and this side of the signaling, which is synaptoclastic signaling. And just as you get osteoporosis when you have too much osteoclastic activity and not enough osteoblastic activity, you get Alzheimer's disease when you have too much synaptoclastic activity and not enough synaptoblastic activity. Okay, so that gives us a completely different view of Alzheimer's from what's been out there. And it tells us very much what to do in terms of prevention and reversal. Okay, so what this suggests then is that many of these chronic illnesses like Alzheimer's are really signaling imbalances. I mentioned osteoporosis. You outstrip for years the osteoblastic activity with the osteoclastic activity. Cancer, same idea, but now because of typically somatic mutations, you have more cytoblastic activity. You are making and keeping more cells than turning over the cells, cytoclastic activity, and you develop what's called cancer. 
what we found in the laboratory is that the same sort of thing happens with Alzheimer's disease. There's a whole set of signals that are synaptoblastic and they have to do with your trophic activity and your nutrition and your lack of inflammation and your energetics. On the other hand, there's a whole set of things that are synaptoclastic and that has to do with inflammation and poor support and toxins and things like that. And when there is a mismatch between these four years, you end up with Alzheimer's disease. So we can look at this as a network insufficiency. So you have these different subsystems within your brain, and one of them is very important for plasticity, so neuroplasticity. And this particular, particular system has, as I mentioned, a whole set of things that are synaptoblastic, a whole set of things that are synaptoclastic. So your probability of getting Alzheimer's, which is what I'm expressing here, probability of getting Alzheimer's is proportional to the integration over time, what happens to you when you sum up all the different things that are synaptoclastic that are pulling back and then oh, divided by all the different things that are growing forward, the synaptoblastic signaling. So when we want to treat people, we want to identify those, we want to reduce the synaptoclastic signaling, we want to increase the synaptoblastic signaling. Okay, so what are those things? Well, they're approximately equal to four major groups. So anything that is an inflammatory mediator, and I mentioned NF-kappa B earlier, but whether you've got infections in the brain, whether you've got leaky gut, whether you've got systemic inflammation, all of these things uh, are critical. These increase risk for cognitive decline. Then in addition to that, various toxins. So then there again, there are many things that contribute to that. They come in three general groups. So it's the, the inorganic ones like mercury and um, people here in California who, uh, who, who were in the California fires, increased risk for cognitive decline. Um, the, the people who were actually the first responders, unfortunately, with the World Trade Center, uh, by 2015, 13% of them already had suffered cognitive decline. So anything that increases toxic exposure, so things like uh, mercury and, and inhaled, uh, uh, anything you know, near a freeway, air pollution. Secondly, organics, again, as I mentioned, things like benzene, toluene, formaldehyde, glyphosate, all of these things that contribute to toxicity. And then the third group, the biotoxins, things like trichothecenes, ochratoxin A, gliotoxin, all of these things are potential risk factors. On the other hand, on the denominator, you're looking at things that decrease it and things that if they're too low, you're increasing your risk for Alzheimer's. So energetics, absolutely crucial. When someone, is beginning in that pathway toward Alzheimer's, virtually everyone is reduced in their energetic support for the brain. And you can see this. If you simply look at a PET scan, you see decreased utilization of glucose in the temporal and parietal regions, which is one of the reasons that we're so supportive of the idea of ketosis as one of the, you know, one of the many things that is helpful for treatment. So for energetics, we think of four major uh, categories. So one, we wanna have enough cerebral blood flow. So people have gotta have the vascular support there. This is why exercise can be very helpful. Secondly, they have to have enough oxygen. So many people do not realize they are dropping their oxygenation at night when they are sleeping, whether it's from sleep apnea, whether it's from upper airway resistance syndrome or other things good idea for everyone to check your nocturnal oximetry and certainly all the patients that are, that are complaining of cognitive decline or interested in reducing their risk. The third thing is then ketones. You have to have combustible substrates. And for most of us, we've been using glucose too much and we're not metabolically flexible. We need to have that metabolic flexibility so we can burn ketones, we can burn glucose and we can go back and forth. So we have enough energetic support for this amazing synaptic network. You have over 500 trillion synapses in your in this wonderful brain of yours. So very helpful to have a combustible substrate. And then the fourth thing is, of course, mitochondrial function. You've got to have mitochondria to burn these to get the effect. You've got to get the energy. So basically, you have to, you have to move the substrates up there. You've got to have the blood flow. You've got to have the oxygenation that helps you to burn it. You've got to have the mitochondria functioning. and You've got to have the ketones to burn. And then finally, trophic support. And this, again, three sorts of things. It's growth factors, nerve growth factor, BDNF, 
uh, things like that. And then the second thing is hormones, estradiol, progesterone, uh, pregnenolone, testosterone, DHEA, all of these things are critical to support synapses. And then thirdly, it's nutrients, uh, B12, vitamin D, things like this that are absolutely critical. Choline, one of the most common ones where many of us are, are, have reduced and are, are insufficient in the amount of choline that we take in a day. We should be getting about 550 milligrams of choline per day. And most of us are more like 350 or 400 uh, if you look at it. So that's, this is what tells you what Alzheimer's is, what contributes to it, how you get it, and what to do about it. Now let's test out our theory, which we've been doing. And as I say, the, the trial has really shown that uh, this, this is a correct theory. This is actually showing us what to do. So what this means though, because we have all of these contributors, what this means is if you wanted to develop a perfect Alzheimer's, and we spent years in the lab working on Alzheimer's drugs and actually identified a few, uh, one that, uh, that has gone into trial. But when we started to test this, this was way back in 2012, we realized that there's something wrong here. Um, this is, we're going after one thing, but if you had a perfect Alzheimer's drug, this is what it would have to do. It would have to do so many things that in fact, it's really difficult to get an Alzheimer's drug to do all these things. So what we really want is to look at the drugs in addition to for these precision medicine protocols. And I think that is the future for drug development for Alzheimer's disease. And this shows you why drugs have failed. Single drugs, monotherapies have failed in Alzheimer's disease. So therefore, what we tell the patients is, imagine you have a roof with 36 holes, as I mentioned, because we initially identified 36 different contributors. Again, we know, we know a few more now, but the, the idea is that people have to understand, I'm not just gonna patch one thing. A drug is a really good patch for one hole, but we want to do it on the backbone of a precision medicine protocol, a functional medicine approach so that we can actually patch the other holes. And that's when you begin to see improvements. And that also means we need to think very differently. We need to train the new physicians very differently and then in all the new healthcare workers. So you look at the traditional Chinese physicians, they were fantastic. They understood that, that the whole idea that there was a system working together and it's not just about one organ or another organ. But of course, they didn't know anything about molecular mechanisms, about DNA, about RNA, about specific nutrients, none of that. The modern physicians, very good with DNA and RNAi and stem cells and all these sorts of things, but they've specialized, so they don't tend to treat this as a systems problem. So we need to, to, to train a new kind of physician who really gets this, right? And who puts the whole thing together and can see that, yes, we need to look at the basics, but we also need ultimately to tr treat this as a systems disorder, which it is. So functional medicine has done a tremendous job at looking at these. And Jeffrey Bland, who, who began this uh, years ago, a couple of decades ago now, uh, had really helped to focus as a biochemist. He helped to focus all of us on looking at the actual drivers, so-called root cause medicine. And this is really what's become precision medicine, looking at the drivers of the problem and then going after those. So led to approved outcomes for many illnesses, multiple sclerosis, metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular, lupus, you can go on and on and on. In fact, our own daughter, I had my introduction to this because our own daughter developed early lupus years and years ago uh, when I was still uh, thinking only about classical medicine. And my wife and I took her uh, to two of the world's experts uh, on lupus who both said, yeah, she has early lupus. There's nothing you can do. When she gets much worse, you know, we'll give her some steroids. And we thought, well, well why did she get this? And they're like, well, we just don't know. So then we ended up taking her to a functional medicine physician, not nearly as famous as the other two, who actually said, I know exactly why she got this. Here, her, her, her tests show it. She had a terribly leaky gut. I can fix this problem. Um, she's now been lupus free for over 10 years and it really turned us around to realizing, wait a minute, we need to be looking much more at the root causes of these illnesses instead of just writing a prescription and saying, we don't know what causes them. 
So in, ultimately, this should be the standard of care, especially for complex chronic illnesses where there really hasn't been a lot of success in standard of care medicine. So we need to make these root cause approaches, the both functional medicine and related uh, precision medicine, et cetera, these should become the standard of care. It's gonna be important for us all to be involved with clinical trials to prove that there is efficacy. Otherwise people simply say, we don't believe it. So we actually started way back in 2011, we proposed the first comprehensive trial for Alzheimer's and pre-Alzheimer's. And that was actually, we were not allowed to do it. The IRBs turned this down and said, no, this is too complicated. You're, you're, you're saying that you want to uh, deal with more than one variable at once. And everyone knows that the, the way to do a clinical trial is you just have one variable. Well, we said, well, wait a minute, Alzheimer's disease is not a one variable disease. So this is not the way to go after Alzheimer's. So we then said, okay, we've got to go get anecdotal success before we'll be allowed to perform a clinical trial. So beginning then in 2012, we began to stockpile these anecdotes of success and we published the first 10 of them in 2014, another 10 in 2016, and then in 2018 with 15 other clinics, we published 100 examples where we could document improvement uh, in cognition with people who had Alzheimer's or pre-Alzheimer's. Right. Okay, so then the idea was, okay, now that we've done all these anecdotes, let's go back to the IRBs. And so in 2018, we went back to the IRB and said, please allow us to do a clinical trial of this protocol. And they said, no. And so we thought, you know, what, what more do we need to do? So we made a few changes. And finally, in 2019, uh, we were finally approved to do the trial, this first trial. And so we've now broken this up into two trials. The first one is a proof of concept trial with 25 people. The second one is a larger randomized controlled trial with 100 people. And that one will start later this year. Uh, but the 25 member has just finished in December, really exciting results, which I'll show you here. So we, for, we proposed the uh, proof of concept, finally got approved, as I said, in 2019. And the idea, instead of predetermining a monotherapy, let's look at each person very deeply and let's look and see all the things that are contributing because we know now from the experiments over the last few decades, we know the important drivers. Let's look to see for each person what's happening here and then let's target those and see how they do. So the goals here, you can see the various ones will go right back to what I said earlier. So here you can see, first of all, we want to address the energetics. And as you recall, that was in the denominator of that equation. So we want to get you into ketosis. We want to make sure you've got enough cerebral blood flow, oxygenation, and enough mitochondrial function. And we typically try to get people into the one to four millimolar beta hydroxybutyrate. If you're using the, uh, the biosensor, you're using a, a breathalyzer, and then you want to get over seven in your ACEs. So the bottom line is just as Dr. Stephen Kinane has taught us, in fact, you can bridge that gap. When we see someone with Alzheimer's, that there is an emergency there because these people do not have enough support for their neural network. And we want to bridge that gap with some degree of ketosis. And it's fine at the beginning, start with some exogenous ketosis just to get rid of that deficit. Over time, of course, there are additional advantages to developing endogenous ketosis. And we'll talk a little bit about how we do that because there are other critical pieces to getting the best outcomes. But for the, the, the beginning, you just wanna get people to have the ketones to be able to support their synapses. The second thing is that the vast majority of people who have Alzheimer's do have a degree of insulin resistance. And as you know, there are somewhere around 100 million Americans who have insulin resistance. It's incredibly common. And so it's something that in fact is not good for your brain. When we used to grow brain cells in a dish as part of our experiments, we would always have to include some insulin because it is a trophic factor. So insulin is not just a metabolic hormone, it's also a neurotrophic factor. So no surprise when you have decreased signaling and you can actually measure that, you can measure the phosphorylation that's associated with changes in insulin signaling in the brain with patients with Alzheimer's. This was published a few years ago by Professor Ed Getzel, who showed that virtually everybody with Alzheimer's has some degree of central insulin resistance. Then in fact, when you get that, you are going to have a decreased support for your synapses. So we want to create 
insulin sensitivity as part of the overall approach with people who have cognitive decline or who are interested in reducing their risk for cognitive decline. And then, as I mentioned, trophic support, three different things, growth factors, hormones, and nutrients, they're all critical. Optimizing all of those things is helpful to people who have cognitive decline. And again, you can go back, you can think of cognitive decline as it's progressing to Alzheimer's as essentially a fundamental insufficiency. You've got this network, you are not supporting the network. The supply is not meeting the demand, unfortunately. And this looks like it is a common theme for a number of neurodegenerative conditions. So we need to understand why the supply is not meeting the demand. One of the contributors, very common, neuroinflammation. And again, the goal here is not just to give an anti-inflammatory. We wanna first resolve the inflammation, but while we're doing that, we want to determine why that inflammation is there. It's absolutely crucial. So if you've got a leaky gut, it's not gonna do you much good if you don't heal that. If you've got chronic sinusitis, if you've got changes in your oral microbiome, if you've got poor dentition, if you've got tick-borne illnesses, all of these things are potential contributors. So you want to identify those and get rid of them while you are resolving inflammation. We typically use resolvins and then preventing further inflammation with and then all sorts of things you can use for that. Of course, things from omega-3s to curcumin to ginger to all sorts of wonderful uh, anti-inflammatories. But again, in the long run and for sustainable improvements, you want to get rid of what's causing it. And I should say, as far as sustainability, that's been the most exciting thing. We've now had people who started way back in 2012 who are now nine years on the program and who have continued their improvement and have sustained it. So very different from if you go on a drug, you may get a little bump, then you go right back to declining because you're not getting at what's actually causing the problem. So we want to resolve the inflammation, we want to prevent further inflammation, and we want to remove the source of the inflammation. And that means treating the pathogens and optimizing the microbiomes. And so, so many people, as you know, have abnormal gut microbiomes, and this has been linked both with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, as well as many other conditions, inflammatory conditions, all sorts of different things linked to changes in the gut microbiome. We're also interested in the oral and the sinus microbiomes because these things all can contribute to cognitive decline. So treating the pathogens and then detoxification. When we first started this back in 2012, we did not realize how important toxins were what an important role they played in Alzheimer's disease. And what happened was we had a number of people who had responded early on before we knew about the toxins. We had a separate group that simply did not respond and they look different. They often present differently. These are often relatively young people in their late forties, early fifties, very common. When I was training in neurology back in the 1980s, we never saw people in their fifties with Alzheimer's. We saw it in sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties, we didn't see these young people. And I've gone back and asked some of my colleagues to say, wait a minute, is this something we were seeing back then? And everyone agrees, we just weren't seeing it. And by the way, there was an epidemiological study just about a year ago that showed that in fact, early onset Alzheimer's has been on the rise. And I think that one of the things that seems to contribute is toxins, because when we then took that group and asked, this group that's not responding, what's wrong here? What's wrong with these people? So we started looking at their very detailed histories. And we found that a lot of them had exposure to various toxins. And so this is why we tend, we look at all three, we look at the metals and inorganics, we look at the organics, we look at the biotoxins and getting detoxification is absolutely crucial for the people who have toxin induces, which is what we call type three Alzheimer's disease. They're not going to get much better unless you deal with those toxins. Now, no question, Many people have combinations. They may have both some, uh, some glycotoxic and some organotoxic. Okay, they may do very well then for a while with improving their insulin uh, resistance, getting them insulin sensitive, getting rid of the glycotoxicity, but they tend to plateau then. So you're gonna have to ultimately deal with the toxins. And then stimulation, it's very interesting. When you're doing these other things, you're now setting up the nervous system to work better. The signaling is now, yes, we're ready to grow again. It's actually helpful to have some stimulation, no different than lifting weights. 
stimulation for your brain, whether you use light stimulation, such as violite, a lot of people like to use, whether it's laser, some people like to use, magnetic stimulation, MERT is another one that some people like to use. And of course, brain training itself is one form of cerebral stimulation. All of these things do seem to be helpful in getting best outcomes. And then improving the adaptive immune system and reducing the innate, the inflammatory. As I mentioned, you see this both with COVID-19 and with Alzheimer's. You have a mismatch between the innate system, which is on chronically in Alzheimer's, which is on acutely in COVID-19, and the adaptive system, which is just not kicking into gear to get rid of the problem. And so what happens, the A-beta itself, the very thing that we vilify in Alzheimer's disease is in fact part of your innate immune system. So it literally is covering the pathogens. And for anyone who's familiar with uh, with propolis from beehives, you get an invader into a beehive, they get covered with propolis. This is a thing that will, will solidify. Um, it has an anti-inflammatory effect, interestingly, uh, but it actually solidifies and is a protectant and protects them from, uh, from uh, for example, pathogens. And A-beta is very much like this. It is something that your immune system is making to cover the bad guys. It covers bacteria, it covers fungi, actually has an antiviral effect as well. So as long as you have this chronic inflammation, you're gonna continue to make the amyloid that we associate with Alzheimer's. So what we wanna do then is we wanna support the adaptive system and quiet down the innate system over time to get the best outcome. And some people like to use things like low-dose naltrexone as part of this, but again, finding the reason for it is the most important thing. And then reducing the amyloid beta itself. You don't wanna do that at the beginning. And so again, all of these drug trials, we've seen a number of people who, no surprise, not surprisingly, if you look at the how this works, if you just remove the protectant, you just remove the amyloid without doing anything else, people will sometimes get much worse. And we've seen this in several cases now where each time they would get the injection to remove the amyloid, they would clearly get worse. Then they'd kind of slowly fight their way back because the injections are typically once a month, they get the injection and go downhill once again. In fact, one of the patients went from a MOCA score of 22 out of 30 down to six with these injections over two years. And I asked his wife, because she had been involved with this trial, you know, why, why didn't you stop this getting injected with when, when you saw how much he got worse each time? You know, why didn't you stop it? And she said, the doctors know what they're doing. Well, you know, in this disease, not always. So we're all looking at what's the best way to get the best outcome. So now theoretically, the best way is we're going to address the things that are causing the problem, the root causes. Now, after that, we want to slowly reduce, reduce the amyloid beta. That makes much more sense. And I actually think that these amyloid reducing drugs are going to be quite valuable as a second phase after you've gotten rid of the reasons that it's there. But just using them by themselves before you do anything else is asking for problems. And then ultimately, you have to remember, now we've got people signaling on the right way, but they've already lost for many of them. They've already lost a number of synapses. They may have lost millions of synapses. So regeneration synaptogenesis, and that is supported by things like trophic factors. You can increase your BDNF, for example, with whole coffee fruit extract. There is intranasal nerve growth factor that has been in trials. We'll see how that goes. Intranasal uh, divunitide, which is another trophic factor, failed. It was used as a monotherapy. Well, again, in the long run, using it as part of an overall protocol, I think it's got tremendous potential. And then things like stem cells. So there are all sorts of ways. And so what's interesting is we've all been told that there's nothing you can do to prevent, delay, or reverse cognitive decline of Alzheimer's disease. And nothing could be further from the truth. There is a tremendous arsenal that we all have access to, but we need to get people to come in early and we need to look at what's actually driving the problem. And we have hundreds and hundreds of examples now of people who've improved and have, in fact, have a book coming out in August 
uh, which is called the, the First Survivors of Alzheimer's. Seven people wrote their stories about what it was like to be told that they were going to die and then what it was like to get better with Alzheimer's and get back to doing what they were interested in doing. So we've developed a, an app that people can follow all these different things because we think in the long run, it's helpful for people to look at these. Let me show you a few examples, and then we'll talk about the trial. So here's, this is pre, these are people who were actually before the trial. This is a guy who started in 2013. And you can see here in the green, where is where he started. Very poor testing, for example, auditory delayed uh, memory here. This is a smart guy, but his auditory delayed memory was down here at about the 12th percentile or so. And you can see these dramatic improvements here uh, after a couple of years on treatment. And uh, so he has done you know, particularly well and, and it, you know, has, done has gotten back for example one of the things that's, that happened with him is he was very good at adding uh, whole columns of numbers he would meet with his accountants and say oh yeah this is about oh yeah about four hundred thirty thousand. like wow you can really do that quickly he lost that ability with his alzheimer's he got it back and i should say as far as his having alzheimer's he had pet scan proven uh, alzheimer's he had a copy of apoe4 single copy uh, which is the most common genetic risk factor for alzheimer's so if you look at the whole country, about three quarters of us are APOE4 negative. So we, have, so for example, I checked myself, I'm a 3-3, that's kind of the most common. But about 75 million Americans have a single copy of APOE4, which as I said, that's is the most common genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. It doesn't mean you're going to get it, but if you have zero copies, your lifetime risk somewhere around 9%. It's not zero, but it's not terribly high. If you have a single copy, as this man did, then you have, as man does, um, then you have about a 30% lifetime risk. And if you have two copies, it's well over 50%. It's more likely that you will develop Alzheimer's during your life than that you will avoid it. So this is a huge issue and we recommend that everybody find out their status and get on appropriate prevention or early reversal. Again, the, the approach which has been backward over the years is, well, don't bother to find out because there's nothing you can do about it. Again, nothing could be further from the truth. Here's another example. So this is a woman who's actually now in her late 70s who's done very well. You can see here dramatic improvements. And not only did she improve her cognition, but she improved her hippocampal volume and she also improved her PET scan results as well. Here's a third guy, 66 year old man came in. This is actually a, a very smart physician who came in a number of years ago. Um, family history, both of his parents had died with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this guy also had single copy of APOE4. He'd already been evaluated, had a markedly positive amyloid PET scan, had an FDG PET, which was uh, typical for Alzheimer's. So he had both the amyloid PET and the FDG PET were abnormal. His hippocampal volume was already reduced and his neuropsych testing showed that he was already well into MCI on his way to Alzheimer's disease. So you can see why, if you look here, he had a very, very high HSCRP. We like to see him less than 1.0, preferably even less than 0.5. This guy had one that was almost 10. So he had ongoing inflammation. Homocysteine, which should be seven or lower, his was 15. Vitamin D, we like to see it between 50 and 80. His was 21. His testosterone was low. His free T3 was low. His TSH was a bit too high. So all of these things. So he responded beautifully and this guy, as a physician, question, you know, he had called me about whether that we were doing any clinical trials. And I said, well, we're not there yet, but if you come in, we're doing something that's helped a number of people. This was before publishing anything. And, you know, let's, let's talk. And so as I went through everything, he kept saying to me, you know, I don't believe this. I don't believe that this doesn't seem to be something that's going to help me on and on. So finally, I said to the guy, after about 20 minutes, I said, look, give me six months. If I can't make you better, then you go somewhere else. He said, there is no other place. I'm like, okay, well, give us a chance then to do, to uh, help you. And he did very, very well. And interestingly, you can see here from his, uh, both his metabolic profile and his, uh, and his MRI. So you can see his fasting insulin. It's still not perfect. We like to see him down at four or five, but it's so much better than it was at 32. His HSCRP, again, not perfect but it's so much better than it was. His homocysteine, not quite perfect, but much better than it was. Vitamin D, better. So he did very, very well. And interestingly, his hippocampal volume actually increased. 
his gray matter increased here by 23%. So really striking results. We published these cases in, in these papers that I mentioned earlier, uh, published a couple of books on this as well. And these are now available in 32 languages, so you can get these anywhere. And so all of this led then to the trial that, I'm, that we've just finished that I mentioned earlier. And I'm really fortunate and honored to have worked with Dr. Anne Hathaway, Dr. Kat Toops, and Dr. Deborah Gordon, three outstanding functional medicine physicians. Uh, Anne is in the Bay Area near San Francisco. Uh, Kat is in the East Bay, and Deborah Gordon is in Oregon and Ashland. Um, all fantastic physicians who saw these 25 patients. And so this is, as I mentioned earlier, this is the first trial in which instead of predetermining a treatment, we actually went through, look, and this is registered with clinicaltrials.gov as all these clinical trials are. As I mentioned earlier, we were denied initially, and then finally approved. The control group was denied, uh, but we were allowed to do this proof of uh, uh, principle, and now we'll go back with a with a bigger one here. And then was mentioned 25. So we looked at people with MOCA scores of 18 and above. So this is out of 30. Um, typically when you're between 28 and 30, that's typically considered normal. If you drop below that for anywhere from about 22 to 26, and it depends again, 26, 27 depends on other factors as well. That's typically MCI. When you're down below 22, these are people who 18, 19, 20, this is all full on Alzheimer's disease. The average for all Alzheimer's patients, late, intermediate, and early is 16.2. So you can see these are people that we would be considered MCI or early Alzheimer's, not late Alzheimer's. We need to do a separate trial for the MOCAs of zero to 17 because it's likely we'll have to do additional things to improve them. Although to be fair, we've had a few people, uh, wonderful anecdotes of people with MOCA scores of zero who improved, but they don't come all the way back to normal. They improve, they can dress themselves again, they can speak again, they can get on the internet again, things like that, but they don't come all the way back to a MOCA of 30. On the other hand here, we had some patients who went from MOCA scores of 18, one of them with 18, one of them with 19, all the way back to perfect 30s. So we're very excited about that. This was supported by the Evanthea Foundation and the Four Winds. This is Diana Merriam and her family. Um, and we worked with the QuestGen CRO. I'm very happy to have done that. Um, this compares, as I said, personalized precision medicine protocol for nine months. So we didn't have to wait years. Typically this is done for years because they're looking for tiny, tiny effects. We were looking for bigger effects. So we did it for over nine months. And we wanna look at all the contributors, just the ones we talked about earlier. Okay, how are we doing on time here? All right, so let's see here. Okay, so. MOCA scores we looked at. We also use CNS vital signs. And this was really helpful because it's a much more sensitive evaluation of these people. And so you can look at people even with MOCA scores 27, 28, 29, and see which ones are really doing well and which ones have already started to fail. So CNS vital signs, very, very helpful here. And then AQ21 is something that the partner fills out to say, have they had problems with this? Have they had problems with that? Have they had problems with this? Very helpful to have an idea of how many problems the spouse has noted or the study partner has noted. And then also we go back to that same thing with what's called the AQ20 because one of the questions is irrelevant there, but we wanna now look at what's improved and what's not improved. So you can get a negative score on the AQ20 if you've fallen off, you get a positive score if you've improved. So looking at all these different things, we can really get a good look. And we also do MRIs with volumetrics at the beginning and MRIs with volumetrics at the end. So we can look to see, did they improve subjectively? Did they improve objectively? Did they improve radiologically uh, over the nine months? So again, we look at insulin sensitivity, we look at mild ketosis, all the things that we have talked about. We wanna treat the identified pathogens. We wanna detox for those, all the things that I talked about just a few minutes ago, we addressed in this particular trial. There, okay. And so what we found from this trial, and we're just getting set to, to send this in for publication, but I can summarize it by saying, we had unprecedented improvements in these people. And in fact, we saw improvements not only in their CNS vital signs, in their MOCA scores, in their AQ20s, but also in their MRIs. So very excited to be reporting these data. And this is going to set us up now for the next trial. And I think that this will help all of us 
to improve the way that we evaluate and treat people who have Alzheimer's and especially to prevent it and to treat as early on as possible. So the bottom line here is that cognitive decline is reversible for most patients with, uh, with MCI or early uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, for those uh, whose cognition declines, one of the things that we learned from this, there were a couple of people who didn't improve. What was really interesting though, is we could see why. So there was one, as an example, <clears throat> one person who was living with high degree of mycotoxins. <clears throat> And despite all the suggestions from the physician, despite the health coach, all that said, I'm not moving, not getting rid of these, I'm not doing that. No surprise, did not improve. So I think that we can begin to see, instead of just telling people you got Alzheimer's, we have no idea why, we can begin to see for people why, who's going to improve, and who's not going to improve. Now, as I mentioned earlier, for those with lower MOCA scores who really have significant Alzheimer's, we have to do a separate trial. I'm actually really enthusiastic about this because we want to see what does it take when someone has a MOCA score of five or 10 to really get improvements. What we've seen are small improvements, people going from zero to five, for example, which makes a huge subjective change in their lives, but it doesn't really get them anything close to, to back to normal. So we'd like to understand what does it take to do that? And then feasibility may be improved with simplification. One of the big issues, and uh, Dr. Kat Toops men mentioned this, I think Kat made a very good point. This is not easy. You're getting people to change their behavior. You're getting people to do things like check their, you know, their home for mold and they're looking at people doing detox. This is not easy. So what we've shown is that it's possible. We haven't shown that it's practical. And that's what we need to do. We need to do more simplification. We need to get people on earlier. No question, people, it's much easier to do this when you start early. But this does provide us wonderful support for this larger trial that I mentioned, which is gonna start uh, later this year. And I'm very excited about the possibility of now taking this general idea and being able to move it toward using this for other neurodegenerative diseases, things like Lewy body disease and vascular dementia and ALS and frontotemporal dementia, because the same general idea applies. Now, each one has its own unique biochemistry, so we would have to target to the biochemistry of each of these, but I think the possibilities are very exciting here. Then finally, combining the results of this with previous findings, that there's a decades long, as I mentioned, you have a couple of decades before you get a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. If you simply know that and you get started early, this really suggests that if we all do the right things, Alzheimer's disease really could be optional now instead of unavoidable. It's always been thought to be unavoidable. We can really make it now optional. Okay, so just as for leprosy and polio, Alzheimer's shall become a former scourge and we're just taking the first steps toward that. So with that, let me finish up here. Let me stop the sharing and get back to the, there we go. And happy to answer any questions. Wow, Dr. Bredesen, thank you so much. This is Ben from The Real Truth About Health. And that was phenomenal. I, I know I can speak on behalf of anybody, everybody here to say how privileged we are to not only learn about your groundbreaking work, but my gosh, you're sharing uh, cutting edge results that you haven't even published yet. So thank you for that. It means a lot to all of us. Um, I want to do just a little bit of housekeeping as we go into this Q&A session. So uh, bear with us. And, and that is this. We want to make sure that everybody knows what to do. Um, in fact, I'll post it one more time here in the chat. And so what you want to do, everyone, to ask Dr. Bredesen a question, we don't take questions directly from the chat box, but what we do is we have you raise your hand and ask him that question directly. So in case you don't know how to raise your hand, there should be a reactions tab along with all of your Zoom controls, either at the bottom or the top or the side of your screen. You click on that reactions tab and there's different functions that come up. You click on the raise hand button. We will see all the raise hands uh, coming in. In fact, we already see a few. And uh, once you click on that, we take those questions in order in which they've come. We will ask you individually one at a time to go ahead and unmute yourself. Of course, everyone, you're seeing uh, some contact information for Dr. Bredesen on the screen as well. Um, and so a couple of other things about that. Uh, number one, in case you don't have a reactions tab, you might try your participants tab. You might see the raise hand function there. The other thing is we ask everyone, and I see a lot of questions coming in. So we're gonna ask everybody, please ask only one question of Dr. Bredesen. Keep it brief. 
and try to think of a question that is relevant to a large group of people and not just specifically about yourself, if possible. Um, and so with that, Dr. Bredesen, if you're ready. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Thank you. There's you know, lot, lots of ways to get information. Um, I, I mentioned a couple of the books. You can get uh, information from uh, Apollo Health. We work with Apollo Health uh, to develop uh, software because we think that you know, more and more we're going to need larger and larger data sets to understand these. So please, yeah, o- open to questions. Perfect. Thank you so much. And so with that, we're going to go to our first question. Uh, Deb, if we can ask you to unmute, and we look forward to your question for Dr. Dale Bredesen. Hi, Deb. Hello. Hi, hi, uh, Dr. Bredesen. Um, My question has to do with how we can get the information out in a speedier way. Um, I live in Arizona and there's a lot of assisted living facilities and people that aren't really experiencing any decline are going in just because it's a more of a convenience situation. And it, it just seems like a good potential portal to, to, to do your protocol in some of these assisted living facilities. Wow, Deb, that is such a great question. Thank you for asking that. Uh, and I do think this is the future. You know, we want to get you think about this, going into an assisted living facility has always meant one thing, you're gonna go downhill and you're going ultimately, unfortunately, gonna pass away. This has been a terminal illness. The idea now is let's have people who go in and, and then get help and then come back out again. That's the goal. And so I don't know, are you a member of RALNA? Do you know RALNA, the Residential Assisted Living uh, National Association? It's uh, there are over 14,000 members of RALNA. So you might wanna contact RALNA. So I, we've just started working with RALNA to make it so that we have this protocol accessible to you know, as many assisted living facilities as possible. Now, you know, you brought up a good point. People go in, and they, the, the earlier they go in, actually now the better in terms of getting people to do the right things and hopefully getting them back out. And I should mention, there's one facility that's been started in San Diego, which is called Marama, M-A-R-A-M-A, it was started by Dr. Heather Sanderson, who's trained with us uh, and is an ND herself and has done a fabulous job and has dealt with many patients. And so, so she thought the same thing and she actually set up uh, the first such facility in which she brings people in and then she, and she's had very good results. And in fact, she uh, pointed out to me a number of months ago that the people in her facility are not declining. So very exciting results. This is just at the beginning. And boy, wouldn't we all love to see fewer people who are going downhill in these assisted living facilities. Now, the one negative, as you already know, we want to get people even before that. So therefore, one of the things to do as you see people in the assisted living facility and hopefully do, if you can say to their families, they're going to stay sharper longer and be able to interact with you for years and maybe even get out of the facility, that would be the hope. But even if they don't, they should do very well for a long time and you can have more time with your loved one. We also recommend, please make sure since this is now, you're seeing that someone in the family developed cognitive decline, please get the members of your family evaluated so that you literally end the problem with the current generation. Thank you, Dr. Bradison, for that. And up next, we have Janine. Janine, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself, please. Hi, Janine. Hi, hello. Thank you very much for your lecture. I live in Australia and um, I've recently lost someone to Alzheimer's and we had never, well, I have never heard, and I don't believe they were ever offered any sort of functional medicine. So I don't even know if it is here. But my actual question is, you did mention um, ketosis, and um, I don't think you quite got to that. Do you, how do you recommend a protocol for that? Is it a plant-based ketosis yes. or fasting every now and then? I'm sure the meat and cheese ketosis isn't the most healthy way to go. So I'm just curious about ketosis um, yeah. for a health perspective with Alzheimer's. Yeah, great, great question. Thank you very much, Janine. So first of all, yes, lots, there's been, uh, we've trained uh, over 2000 physicians in 10 different countries. Um, and a number of them are, are in Australia. Uh, you can look at Dr. Dave Jenkins, for example, um, look up, there's a, a book by Peter Dredge, uh, whose wife improved on our protocol, and he wrote about it. Uh, and, and then again, we go into this, um, the, what we use is called KetoFlex 12.3. But again, we're agnostic whatever helps the patients. And so the the biochemistry is that 
It helps people to become insulin sensitive. It helps them to have specific phytonutrients. So yes, this the, here are the combination. So number one, we wanna target mild ketosis. It is a plant rich. You can be a vegetarian or a vegan if you want. You don't have to be, um, you know, you can have some fish, some uh, grass fed beef, some pastured chicken, but whatever you do, the biochemistry is toward driving you to mild ketosis. And then you wanna have uh, high fiber that improves glycemic load, as you know, glycemic index, it improves your lipid profile, it helps you with detox, lots of good things about having that fiber, improves your microbiome. So, so you know, prebiotic and probiotics, very helpful. Of course, without a leaky gut, you know, we wanna make sure that you heal your gut as well. And this was all part of this trial. And then you wanna have fasting. Fasting is critical. It is supportive for getting rid of that amyloid. It is supportive for having an anti-inflammatory effect on your brain. It is supportive for helping to get you into ketosis. So all of these things work together to improve your outcome. And again, there, there are absolutely people uh, in Australia who are doing this, a, a number of people who have uh, trained with this. So yes, please, I, I'm, I'm sorry to hear uh, about your family, but please make it so that everybody else gets evaluated and gets on early treatment or early prevention um, so that you never see this again in your family. That's the goal. Thank you, Dr. Bredesen. And up next, we have Denise. Denise, if you can go ahead and unmute, please. Hi, Thank you so much for such an informative uh, presentation. And um, I wanted to ask, um, I'm sure you know about also the work of Dean and Aisha Sharzai. And sure. I wonder if you could tell me regarding the nutrition uh, portion of the Sharzai's program, do you have any agreement with them uh, in terms of the nutrition. And one, one other little adjunct with that is when you were talking about choline, I was just thinking about how so many of our doctors, Dr. Kim Williams, for example, uh, alerts us that we really don't wanna eat choline because it helps create TMAO in our bodies and that's not good for heart or brain. So if you could maybe address that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks, thanks Denise. So yeah, a couple of things. So uh, we'll talk about choline and then we'll talk about Sherzai's. And so the choline, uh, yeah, you know, again, you want to get the right amount, not too much, not too little. You don't want to have a ton of extra, but again, remember TMAO is much more of a problem for people with a lot of meat in their diet, much less of a problem for people who are more vegetarian. So uh, at the same time, you don't want to be low in choline because the most important neurotransmitter in Alzheimer's, which is low in Alzheimer's, is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is the most important neurotransmitter uh, for memory. Uh, so we don't wanna be low in choline and you're absolutely right. We don't wanna be so high off, off the charts that we're increasing our TMAO. Now, as far as the Schur's eyes, we have some areas and I think you know it's important. We're all trying to see improvements in cognition and I respect what, what Dean and Aisha are doing. I respect what Dean Ornish is in the middle of his own trial uh, for cognitive decline. But I should say that you know, the, when we've all written books about this, but what we've published is the, we're the only ones who've published a, a, a study. So we published in 2014, we published 2016, 20. So we're the only, only ones who've published results. Everybody else is saying, well, we, we read this and this is good idea, this or that's good idea. Um, we all need to be publishing. And as I mentioned just a few slides ago, um, this is why we all need to be doing clinical trials. And again, as I said, Dean is doing one. It is going to come out in about, it's going to be finished in about a year. His is very different. It's going to be just lifestyle for, you know, the question is, can lifestyle help cognitive decline? With Dean and Aisha, they have their own approach, whole foods, uh, that, you know, that sort of thing, which is, which is fantastic. They tend to be uh, not as interested in ketosis. And they've, had, they've written in the past that they believe that ketosis can contribute now, again, we would argue with that. And I think at some point it would be great to have all of us in the same room talking about this and saying you know, why we, each one of us thinks that, that one, our approach is going to work. But again, the bottom line is we're all interested in the same thing, reducing the global burden of cognitive decline. And I think we're all seeing some results. I'm, I'd, I'd love to see the publications uh, when they're ready from the other groups, because that's the only way to prove. Otherwise, you're just making claims. We want to prove these claims by publishing them in peer reviewed journals. Uh, we continue to believe and we see again and again, the people who do the best 
uh, do get into ketosis and they do this more plant rich, high fiber with appropriate fasting. Now, again, I think it's important to realize there's not necessarily one right answer. Anything that's giving you good outcomes, just like you know, we've heard about the fact that some people who've done very well with longevity have had high carbohydrate diets, high complex carbohydrate diets, of course. Others have had very low carbohydrate diets. So there's, there's not just one way to get a good outcome, but you need to understand the underlying biochemistry that's going to give you, and neurochemistry, that's going to give you best outcomes. And that's why we did the trial, and that's what we're seeing with these people. Excellent, Dr. Bredesen. Thank you for that. And up next, we have Rita. Rita, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Welcome back, Rita. Thank you very much, Dr. Bredesen. My friend, Aarti Batavia, introduced your work to dietitians community. And yeah. my question to you is that, which probiotic to take and what strength to use and how long to use? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, and we get questions all the time. And again, I'm agnostic about whatever helps people. So, I mean, the as far as probiotics, um, I myself tend to like to use Garden of Life, which is which is uh, David Perlmutter's uh, group. And I think David's done a great job. But there are others, some like VSL3. Um, I'm sure, you know, RT would probably give you a uh, a better result, a better answer on this than I would. I'm interested in, it depends again on, you know, there, there's a lot of work recently on uh, uh, Acromancia mucinophila and its potential importance in preventing neurodegeneration. So things are changing. Uh, as uh, Dr. Knight, who's done so much work on the microbiome has said, there's a lot that we don't yet know about what's optimal for each person. We do know, on the other hand, that there are certain microbiome alterations that are associated with uh, with likelihood for Alzheimer's increasing, and that there are some that seem to be associated with decreasing. And they can even take transgenic mice and increase or decrease their likelihood by changing their microbiome. So there's no question that it plays a role. I'm, I, to be honest, I'm much more concerned about leaky gut than, than the, the specific probiotic because leaky gut is so incredibly common. It's doing the very things that we worry about with cognitive decline. It's giving you that increase in inflammation. It's exposing you to fragments and even whole bacteria that are giving you increased risk. So I'm much more concerned about healing the gut than I am about which probiotic you choose to take. And I have to say, if you choose the best one, it'll actually be food. So, you know, things like uh, fermented foods of various sorts, um, my wife, who's an integrative physician, um, likes to use uh, fermented beets. Uh, but whether you like, you know, other fermented foods, uh, kimchi, sauerkraut, whatever you happen to like, fermented foods would probably be the number one ahead of, you know, anything you can do with food instead of a pill, you're usually in better shape doing it that way. Thank you, Dr. Bredesen. And uh, I just want to say to our entire audience, thank you for keeping your questions direct and brief. That's perfect. We have a lot of questions to get to here. Uh, we're going to get to them as many as we possibly can, but you keeping them short and brief gives as many people an opportunity to ask those questions. So thank you to everybody. That's great. And up next, we have Diane. Diane, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you. My father died at age 89 from Alzheimer's. What is my hereditary risk? What was his APOE status and what, what's your APOE status? I'm sorry, what? Yeah, so the, the hereditary risk ha has about 32 different genes associated with it. The most common one is APOE, and APOE is typically two, three, or four, and you have two copies, so you can be a three, three, or a two, three, as I mentioned earlier. So it, it depends on whether your father was APOE four positive or negative, and whether you are. So uh, you, it's very simple to find out your APOE status. You can do it through your doctor. You can do it through my APOE. You can do it through uh, 23andMe, anything you like, uh, but it's very helpful to find that out. There are other genes that are less common. Um, TREM2 is another one that increases risk, for example. Uh, and then there's a whole set of them that will all contribute to this. But what you want to know first and foremost, is whether you are APOE 2-3, 3-3, or 3-4, or 4-4. Four, four. Um, those are the most common ones. And please, yeah, get absolutely, if you are uh, over 45, 
please get on prevention. Um, it's not going to hurt you in any way, and it's going to help you in many ways and reduce your risk. I can tell you much more about your risk if you find out what your APOE status is. As I mentioned earlier, no copies, about 9% through your lifetime, single copy, about 30%, two copies, oh, well over 50%. And there are other genes you can look at to adjust that, to find out whether you're closer to 90% or closer to 50%. And then of course, it depends a whole lot on your lifestyle and what this, in, in all the different things that you're doing and what you're exposed to. Simply living near polluted freeways, for example, increases your risk. Being in the California fires increases your risk. And there's a whole set of things. So you can actually get a pretty good risk profile today. We set up something called uh, Precode, which does exactly that. So that you can look at your risk profile and you can look at what are the things you can do to reduce your risk. Thank you so much, doctor. And up next, we have Michael. Michael, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself for Dr. Dale Bredesen. Hi, uh, Dr. Bredesen. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Um, so my question has to do with uh, homocysteine. And specifically, I guess, because MTHFR is such a common right. uh, mutation, I was wondering... Whether someone's heterozygous or a homozygous, um, if the digits, let's say they're the, the level is devil, like almost at a hundred or in the hundreds, I'm wondering as far as vascular integrity, could that be restored uh, completely um, whenever it's discovered it's that high through, you know, methylcobalamin, methylfolate, trimethylglycine? Any other things that should be considered if someone, uh, if people with these uh, mutations want to restore their the integrity or any any sort of damages that it causes um, in the brain, anything blood brain bar any, anything blood brain blood brain barrier permeability wise, uh, anything to to say along these lines? Yeah, great question, Michael. And, and you're absolutely right. Uh, homocysteine has been associated with Alzheimer's disease risk. And there's some beautiful studies out of the UK that have shown that you literally, as you go above six, there is, you just keep going up and up in risk. And what they showed even more importantly is that after, if you bring it down, you can actually see this risk decline so that people, they followed them over time, then they decreased it back to normal. And then they actually leveled this out. Beautiful studies. And so absolutely, you mentioned uh, this is very common. Now, as you know, the MTHFR mutations typically don't you know, wipe out your ability to, for the methylation. They will often lower it depending on what combination of mutations, whether it's a 1298 or you know, whatever you, you happen to have. Um, as it creeps up though, you're right, as it gets above 13 to 15, that's a concern. And you're talking about up you know, 100. This is definitely increasing your risk. And if so yes, you can start with the things like uh, you know, methylcobalamin and methylfolate and P5P, you can add things like trimethylglycine and you can go up pretty high levels on trimethylglycine. Some people take even you know, 1500 milligrams a couple times a day. And then you can reduce the, your intake, uh, you know, for uh, your intake for, for, for homocysteine, you can reduce your methionine intake. Um, and there's a whole set of foods that actually give you, and we've, we've listed that in the book as well. So you can look at, so there are a number of things you can do to reduce this homocysteine. Um, and then you're right, you know, uh, there's, it can be vascular damage, but decreasing inflammation. And then you, you're probably aware of things like arteriosil, which actually support the glycocalyx and help you to rebuild the artery glycocalyx itself. So I think there's more and more that can be done uh, uh, in the area of homocysteine. And then if there's vascular damage, please also make sure you're, you know, you're not just gonna reduce the, the homocysteine, not just gonna reduce the inflammation, but think about the energetic delivery. Some of these people may do better with better blood flow. Some people have suggested things like EWOT, exercise with oxygen therapy, or HBOT, the, you know, the uh, hyperbaric. So there are a number of ways to make sure that you're getting not only you know, vascular support, but you're getting the right substrates and including oxygen. Uh, to your mitochondria. Thanks, doctor. Up next, we have Anne Marie. Anne Marie, if you can go ahead and unmute, please. Hi. Hi. Thank you. If you could please repeat the test that you recommended a person at age 45 should take to be yes. proactive. And also, the you had mentioned curcumin and ginger, and I think you mentioned two other spices, and I wasn't able to catch them. Please. Yeah, yeah sure. So, uh, so I, I mentioned cognoscopy. 
So you know, the, the idea here is that you know, everybody knows when you, turn, uh, when you turn 50, you should get a colonoscopy. But yeah, please don't forget about your brain either. You know, because we know that these, these uh, changes are starting early. So you can literally go on and just look at mycognoscopy.com. You can get a series of blood tests. You can do this directly. It's very easy to do and look at what your risk factors are and then you know, get on an appropriate prevention program. It's relatively easy to do. No surprise, again, the earlier you start, the easier it is to get good results. Later and later, it takes more and more to do. We still see some people turning around later and later, but please start as early as possible. Then there are all sorts of things to do in terms of anti-inflammation. As I mentioned earlier, you wanna resolve the inflammation as we've learned uh, previously that it's critical to resolve it first and then also to have an anti-inflammatory, but more important to find out what's causing the inflammation and, and reduce that, remove that. So yes, um, I mentioned you know, ginger, curcumin, omega-3s, resolvins, I mean, there are all sorts of other ways to go at this. Um, you know, everybody has their own favorite uh, for anti-inflammatory effects. And some of this is just you know, eating appropriate anti-inflammatory foods and things like that. Lots and lots of things you can do. Some people like to, you know, like to get uh, uh, their turmeric and just you know, shave a little bit on each meal. That's a common thing that's, that's done uh, very, very helpful. So there are lots and lots of ways to go after inflammation, but again, Make sure that you understand why it's there and remove the source first. That's going to be critical. Thanks, Dr. Bredesen. And up next, we have Benny. Benny, if you would go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi. Thank you. Doctor, I've read that heart disease, stroke, and Alzheimer's correlate. Do you think high-fat animal foods may cause amyloids and plant-based diet might prevent or reverse Alzheimer's? Yeah, this is a good point. Um, and so, uh, you know, as with all, all these things, um, there's nuance here. And people often say, you know, what's good for your heart? What's good for your head? Well, in most cases, but, but not always. There, there, there are examples that that's not quite the case. So interestingly, when you're dealing with someone, as an example, uh, APOE 4.4, these people have increased risk for ar arterial disease. They have increased risk uh, for cognitive decline of Alzheimer's as well. But interestingly, they can go on a high fat diet should, it should, typically shouldn't be a high saturated fat diet, but a high good fat diet and their lipid numbers get better. They do very, very well. So the diet that we use is a plant rich, as I mentioned earlier, mildly ketogenic diet. Um, it is rich in fats. It's rich in monounsaturates and polyunsaturates um, and very, very low in carbs and zero with simple carbs. We want to stay away from the simple carbs. You know, and as Mark Hyman has pointed out years ago, there's a triad that you want to stay away with. We call this the, the, the uh, Burfuda triangle, uh, which is kind of silly, but it's an easy thing to remember. So you don't want to have a combination of saturated fats, lack of fiber, and simple carbs. That is a killing triangle because you're now giving yourself, you know, all the negatives without having the nice uh, fiber to, to reduce your glycemic index. And you're now glycating your proteins, you're causing inflammation, you're changing their structure, you're changing their function, and you're really giving yourself an increased risk for both heart disease and brain disease. Thanks, doctor. Up next, we have uh, Vera. Vera, if you'd go ahead and unmute yourself, please. Hello. I was wondering if you will be having a doctor or scientist in the Connecticut area um, participating in your study uh, later this year that you mentioned. You know, that's a great question. So we're just, it's gonna, th this first group had three physicians. This next one's gonna take eight physicians. Um, and we don't yet know about the Connecticut area. It's a great question. Likely to have someone in Miami, likely to have someone in San Diego, uh, likely to have someone in Cleveland. Um, we don't yet know about Connecticut. It's a great question. We have had people though that have trained in our protocol who are all, who are all over Connecticut, New York uh, area. Thanks, doctor. Up next, we have Marilyn Miller. Uh, yeah, Marilyn, that's right, Marilyn. Thank you. If you can unmute Marilyn, thank you. Hello, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Marilyn. My, my partner, um, actually was having some symptoms at, you know, uh, late 60s. 
and she went through your protocol with Dr. Nancy Lonsdorf and it helped tremendously. So I'm so happy to hear that. Yeah, Nancy's been fantastic. So glad that she's doing this. And of course, she brings her Ayurvedic training as well. Uh, and, you know, we've heard this story. And by the way, you know, I, I'm in the same situation. I'm, I'm about to turn 70. Um, so I'm thinking about myself and say, hey, you know, I want to make sure that I have as many more years of good cognition as possible. So I'm glad to hear that she got a good result. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, well, and then so my question is, um, one of the things that we're concerned about is we checked mold because my partner had some indicators on the blood test that she might have been exposed to mold. And yeah. so we had people look at her house and we had the ERMI test. Yeah. But that's really controversial, I found out. Yeah, then, although this is, you know, this is Environmental Protection Agency set up the ERMI test. Uh, what was her ERMI score? Oh. Um, high. It, it was fairly, I think it was fairly high, but not, okay. not terribly. But, okay. um, but then we had two mold companies come in and they said, we can't find anything. And then we had our air tested in all the major rooms and they said, no, you don't have a okay. problem. maybe one room that was maybe a little bit, but that's my question is how, do you have any advice? And then I heard the Emma test is better than the ERMI. Do you have any advice on the mold and how to track that down? Yeah. And then of course there's also the hurts me too test, which is another good one. So yeah. And you know, this is, this has come originally from the some of the pioneering work of, uh, of Dr. Richie Shoemaker. Uh, and, uh, you know, he found over the years that there were people that had all sorts of different health problems that could be traced back to their exposure to these various mycotoxins and other inflammagens. As he's pointed out, uh, you know, water damaged buildings have all sorts of problems and people can sometimes even notice and you can measure this. Now, one thing that's really helpful is to combine these things. Did she check her C4A, TGF beta one, MMP9? If these are all completely normal, then it's likely that she's not having major problems with mold. On the other hand, if these things are high and people sometimes forget to check them and then when they finally check them, they'll find out, oh my gosh, they're off the, off the charts. Uh, so I think this is very, very helpful to know. I have to say, as a classically trained neurologist, I was shocked to see, because we never talked about mold doing anything to anybody. We never talked about whether it was a potentially a cause of cognitive decline or Parkinson's or other problems. And when we started to see patients and started to realize, wait a minute, we've ruled out all these other things. And here they have this tremendous exposure. And when they start to get treated for it, they actually start to improve. You know, I had to say, well, as much as I was very skeptical about that possibility, um, I can't deny the data. It, it just comes back at time and time again. Now, that's not to say that's the only thing. There are people who have other things that also contribute. But for people who have high exposure to these, you, again, you want to look at both. Are the toxins there? And is there a response there? So I would check with her. Please see about what was her C4A? What was her TGF beta 1? What was her MMP9? Dr. Shoemaker likes to look at several others as well, like ADH, for example, and VIP. But no question, these can be very helpful. Then the other thing is, look to see you know, what happens when she's away from that, that source. You know, what happens when, she, when she's out? And then there are some basic things. And we have all this is written in the books. Uh, we also have some guides on this. Uh, but uh, please check these out. There are all sorts of things you can do for general detox because yes, many of us are exposed. And then you have to figure out, okay, is this just exogenous or am I actually colonized? Because it doesn't help ultimately to remove the exogenous if you've now got colonization that can be, for example, in your sinuses, can be, for example, in your gut. Uh, please check out a wonderful book by Dr. Neil Nathan, who's one of the world's experts on this. Uh, and um, he writes a, a beautiful book um, on uh, associated biotoxins on, on uh, it's called Toxic, Heal Your Body. So please check that out as well. Uh, Neil has done a fantastic job with looking and treating uh, these toxins. So uh, certainly I agree with your point. And you know, this is a relatively common problem, unfortunately. And so many of us, we, you know, we're dealing with it, we're, but we don't realize that this is affecting us until down the road when we get 
problems, inflammatory problems. We get you know, cognitive decline. We get rashes. Uh, you know, we get uh, arthritis, things like this that turn out to be. This is really the 21st century is an era in which instead of asking as physicians what it is, what's the diagnosis, we're asking why it is. You know, what is the problem? What, how did it happen? Why did I get cognitive decline? Why did I get arthritis, lupus, you know, on and on and on. Uh, so I think all those things could be helpful for your friend. Thanks, Dr. Bredesen. And up next, we have Alex. Alex, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself, please. Thank you, doctor, for an incredible presentation. Really appreciate your professionalism and um, your um, succinctness. Doc, what, what's an average daily diet intake like for you? Just, just every day foods that you eat every day, I'm sure you eat more for function than anything else. That's an average. Yeah, th I mean, thanks for asking. Um, definitely, I'm not the one to ask. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to learn to do as well as my daughters and my wife. They all do much better than I do. Um, and certainly a great person to follow is, is in, this, uh, in the last book and also one of the seven survivors uh, named Julie G. She has a wonderful website that's called apoe4.info and she talks about her own, she's an apoe 44 her own problems, her own story, her own turnaround. Uh, but in general, I try to do something very similar. Again, I'm trying to be more like Julie G and my wife and my daughters. Uh, but I try to use the, the KetoFlex 12-3 approach, um, typically 12 to 16 hours of fasting. Uh, and um, I'm actually on my fast from last night. Uh, and I try to do uh, a plant rich, not completely. I try to do some fish, try to do some uh, grass fed beef and some pastured chicken. Um, I do um, eat pastured eggs. Um, I'm rec I recognize the issue with the TMAO, but I also, when I checked, I, I, I checked with Chronometer which I find very helpful, you know, a free app, wonderful thing to check. And I found out that no question, my choline intake is too low. Um, and so I try to get some pastured eggs uh, and get in fish and things like that. And you can get choline obviously from liver and other things. Um, and then uh, try to typically eat two meals a day, lots of salads. Um, and again, I think the previous speaker uh, you know, uh, really uh, knows a tremendous amount uh, about appropriate dietary intake. But again, I'm focused on the biochemistry and neurochemistry. What can we do to help your synapses? And it does turn out that those, that's the combination. You want the phytonutrients. You know, there's work, a lot of work just on polyphenols alone as one of many phytonutrients that are very helpful. There's a lot of work published on the Mediterranean diet and the mind diet. But we have found that getting into some degree of ketosis um, tends to be helpful, especially for people who have any symptoms whatsoever or for people who are trying to improve their normal cognition. Uh, so you know, that's the, overall, that's, that's, the kind of, uh, that's the kind of diet that, uh, we, that we are all trying to use. Does that answer your question? Uh, I, we're actually, uh, they're gone, but yes, I... Okay. Surely think it did. Thank you so much, doctor. And uh, up next, we have Nan. Uh, Nan, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself for Dr. Dale Bredesen. Hi, Dr. Bredesen. Thank you so much for this wonderful lecture. Um, my question is probably very simplistic, but I would really like to know your advice on the easiest or the most practical detox program. Yeah, this is a great question. Um, probably the easiest. Now, let me just say that there depends a little bit on whether you're trying to detox from chemotoxins or biotoxins. There are some differences there, but in both cases, you want to do the basics. And, and, and I, I, re, I wrote about that in, in the last book, The End of Alzheimer's Program. We have all sorts of guides on this, et cetera. But uh, you know, you, in general, and then I, and I should add, for chemotoxins, a great book by Dr. Joe Pizzorno uh, called The Toxin Solution. I really, I like that book. I think it's a good one for anyone to read. Um, and then for biotoxins, I mentioned Neil Nathan's book. And then also uh, uh, Dr. Shoemaker uh, has a book on this uh, with, uh, um, uh, with a mold about water damage, the life in the era of water, of, of, uh, of dangerous buildings. So both of those are uh, excellent. But remember that it's a combination of taking in fewer toxins and getting rid of more toxins. 
And so we will, for the, for the, on the getting rid of side, you know, we want to think about we're doing this with our urine, obviously with elimination, we're doing this with sweating, we're doing this through breathing. Um, and so, you know, you want to combine that filtered water, very helpful, um, sweating, very helpful, sauna, especially uh, infrared sauna, whether you like far red or near, uh, near infrared, uh, far infrared is what most people use, but you know, very, very helpful there to do that. And then follow that up with a, a shower with, a, you know, Castile soap or with one of the non-toxic soaps. And there are, again, whole protocols to get ready to do that, um, that have been used uh, very successfully by functional medicine physicians. Um, and then high fiber diets, and then, you know, detox, all the crucifers, very helpful. Um, you know, things like Brussels sprouts, very helpful. And then sulforaphanes, broccoli sprouts, very helpful. Some people like to grow their own broccoli sprouts, sulforaphanes, very, very helpful uh, in these. And then of course, reducing your intake, uh, you know, or, or organic. And if you, if you're not going to do our organic, at least look at the uh, at least look at the dirty dozen and the clean 15. I noticed there was a comment about, uh, about um, uh, you know, beef. Uh, you know, this is, again, I'm agnostic. I understand there are lots of issues. Uh, and my, my wife has been very, uh, very involved with this. Uh, many people feel it's inappropriate to eat any animal at any time. I totally understand that. Other people feel that uh, you know, I'm going to eat fish and I'm going to eat uh, pastured chicken and, and I'm going to eat some grass fed beef because I think it helps my cognition. So, uh, you know, I am agnostic again about these things. I recognize the issues and I think everyone has to make decisions for themselves. But please recognize that so much of what we're being exposed to is remarkably toxic. I had no idea about this, even, even through my training as a neurologist. You know, I grew up in a world where we're all, you know, eating things high in sugar, all eating things, processed foods, just be, without realizing how horrible this is for so many of us. Um, so I think that these are some of the basic things we can all do for detox. And it does help, again, absolutely helps get your probiotics and prebiotics. Um, I have to say, I've noticed clear differences re reading things from uh, my friend and colleague, Stephen Gundry, who's written about this. Um, just noticing changes in yourself that you can clearly notice are associated with improving your detox status and improving your gut status and things like, wow, yeah, I didn't realize how bad things were for my whole life um, until I did the right things. So I think these are things we can all do to improve our lives and improve our longevity and improve our, our likelihood of living very long without these complex chronic illnesses. These really are turning out to be diseases. I think in the long run, these are gonna be labeled as 20th century illnesses. And my, my hope is that by the end of the 21st century, these will all be rare diseases. Thank you, doctor. And uh, up next, um, and I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, I'm sorry if I'm not, it's uh, uh, Sanjita or Sangita. Go ahead and unmute. Oh, you have unmuted yourself. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for excellent, excellent talk. I have been following you and I totally, totally admire you. You are truly cute. Set up like a one classic. I'm just going to take general advice how we can bring your program to the facilities like the bigger corporations like Life Care Centers of America or the Genesis Corporation, something like that, because I truly feel that they can be greatly benefited. And then my one special question is about one of my B patient who we are seeing like little cognitive uh, uh can you hear me no you're breaking up you're on and off I'm hearing little bits and pieces here but what could you repeat the question uh, uh sure so the first question is how we bring your protocol to the uh long-term care bigger corporations so that is my first question. Yeah. Well, let, let me address the first and one. And then my other so let question. Let me address the first one, if I could. Um, so if I may, let me just address the first one. So yes, we're, we're interested in getting this, the word out. We're getting it to long-term care. Where is, so the easiest way uh, is through RALNA, I think. This is uh, 14,000 different uh, residential assisted living groups. Uh, my hope is that that's a place to start. But I think also there are advantages for people who are just beginning a new one, because that's why you don't have to convince people who are already there to get on it. But yes, I hope that there will be help. And I also hope we can bring this ultimately to groups that will offer 
uh, dementia insurance because there hasn't been any such thing in the past. We really need to have this to get people evaluated early. Now, please go ahead with your second question. Actually, doctor, thank you and, and forgive us, Sanjita, but you know we have so many people waiting and just a few minutes left. So we're, we've asked everybody to just ask one question at a time. And up next, we have Mary. Mary, if you'd go ahead with your question for Dr. Gail Bredesen. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Bredesen, for another incredible talk. Um, my you. internet went in and out a couple of times, so I hope you didn't mention this and I just missed it. But I'm wondering if you could comment on 5G or even 4G, um, broadband and wideband as brain pollutants. I've been seeing a lot of literature uh, lately warning about that. Yeah, you know, this is a really good point. So, you know, we, we think in terms of chemotoxins, biotoxins, but we haven't talked much about physical toxins. And these are likely to include things like microwaves and things like 5G broadband and things like this. A very good point you made, and I appreciate your mentioning this. Uh, I know, uh, you know Joe Mercola has been all over this and others have been very interested in this. Now here, as I've always pointed out, here's the issue. We can measure when these things are present, but there's not yet a clinical test that you can simply do on your patients and say, ah, just like we'll, we can ask, do they have exposure to mycotoxins? We can't yet say, can you show me in a clinical test whether this person is suffering from exposure to 5G? I hope that such tests will become available because I agree with you. It would be incredibly helpful. I'm sure, I, well, I think it's highly likely, let's say that I, I can't say I'm sure, but I think it's highly likely that there will be people who will have negative impacts from these things. We simply don't know yet. There's certainly been suggestion, um, and certainly as we get you know, the more and more powerful signals, and we're, we're essentially, this is you know, part of the pollution that's ongoing, and part of this is a physical toxin that we are exposed to. There's been suggestion that it may impact some calcium channels, for example. So I look forward to more work on this, just as we, it took us a lot of years to realize how much damage we were being by processed foods. You're absolutely right. We may find out that we are being damaged by these physical toxins as well. And I look forward to having access to clinical tests to point us in that direction. Thanks, doctor. Up next, and I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, I believe we have Corinne. Corinne, can we have your question? Please unmute. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. I have made a little list for myself for the next time I see a doctor to get a cognoscopy, an APOE test, and a MOCA score. Are they all blood tests? No. So the MOCA score is a simple, you can actually go online and get, you get a MOCA test, or you can do slums, which is a, similar to MOCA. Um, and it's something where you just, you, you're asked a series of questions and your score is from zero to 30. And most of us should score 28, 29, or 30. Um, you know, it's asking you, it, it, the good thing about MOCA is it's testing different things in your memory. It's testing your, uh, testing things like um, your reading. It's testing your ability to name objects. It's testing your executive function, your name recognition, all these sorts of things. So it's testing different areas of your brain. Um, with a cognoscopy, that's a set of blood tests. Yes. So you're looking at things like, do you have ongoing inflammation? Do you have ongoing toxicity? Do you have ongoing problems with, with hormones or with nutrients, things like that? Um, and you can get that actually directly, mycognoscopy.com. Most doctors will not know, unless they've trained, they will not know what a cognoscopy is. Or they'll say, we don't, you know, we, we don't know what it is. We don't believe in it. But again, please, yeah, please make sure that you get on optimal prevention or early reversal. Thanks so much, doctor. Up next, we have uh, BS, uh, are your initials, I believe. If you can go ahead and unmute yourself, BS. BS, I think we may have lost BS. So let's go ahead. Up next, we have Lizbeth. Lizbeth, if you'd go ahead and unmute yourself, please. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Thank you very much for your work, uh, Doctor. I, I believe that you are coming from the future and bringing us this information that will change the world. Uh, I agree with the point that the view of Alzheimer's is a pandemic and that attacks very slowly. 
but and I have read your books and I want to spread this information. I am not a doctor, I am an engineer, but uh -huh. when I go with my community, with parents, neighbors, friends, and I want to spread this information, they 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 told me they believe the doctor, not me, and I really want to spread as much as possible because I believe it's very important prevention. And do you have any idea how can I spread this information? So it's a great, really good point. But first of all, I would say you know the future in medicine is going to have a strong interaction between the engineers, the physical scientists and the doctors, because we need to get this, we need to increase our data set size. We need to increase the way we're looking at specific changes in metabolome, exposome, genome, you know, on and on. And doctors, unfortunately, we've, you know, we've always worked with relatively small data sets. We now need to have whole genomes and whole exposomes and on and on. So in fact, the future of much of the future of medicine is coming from the engineers. And actually, I'll be speaking to the engineers at Stanford uh, and next month. So I do think that, that the engineers have a huge role to play in the future of medicine. And we all as physicians should be interacting and hopefully seamlessly with the ability now to generate appropriate testing. Uh, by the way, we haven't even talked about wearables. This is you know, revolutionizing everything from continuous glucose monitoring, uh, aura rings, looking at heart rate variability, looking at uh, you know, total ketones for the day, ongoing ketosis in real time, all these things, so important, various, uh, uh, various sleep patterns, uh, oxygenation, nocturnal oxygenation, incredibly important. Um, and you, know, you can check your you know, oxygenation at a moment um, uh, for free on your iPhone, um, but you can also get you know, a, 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 an Apple watch and you know, check it all night. So just on and on, all these things that can be very, very helpful. As far as how to get it out there, um, people are doing it with social networking, they're doing it with blogs, they're doing it with their own books, with their own approaches to these things. Uh, talk, you know, going to conferences and talking to people. Uh, and I think you, know, you have a, a good situation because you, know, you, you are an engineer, you can interact with other engineers and speak their language. So I think that you know, getting this into, to people to understand how this is all working, I think there's a tremendous amount you can do to get this out. And you know, convening a, a group of engineers to talk about your own take on what the doctors are doing right and what the doctors are doing wrong could be very, very helpful. And as you probably know, all over Silicon Valley, uh, groups like Google uh, and Apple are looking at, of course, Amazon from Seattle is, are, are all looking at how can we improve healthcare? So I think this is absolutely a, a great time to be involved and a very, very important area for the future. Thank you, Dr. Bredesen. Thank you so, so much. Um, folks, I'm sorry, we're not able to take any more questions at this time. We got a lot in and you were, Dr. Bredesen, you were very gracious with your time and your answers. Um, and that said, would do us a favor, stay with us for just a moment before we okay. let you um, I, again, we want to thank you very much for all of this. Just a couple of quick announcements. Everyone, of course, as you know, tonight, our panel at 7 p.m. Eastern time is the first ever women's panel uh, with The Real Truth About Health. And we're looking forward to having everybody come back for that. That is not to be missed. Absolutely phenomenal. However, one of the things that we've been doing throughout when we take these breaks is we always keep the Zoom meeting on and the conference on. We have a little bit of housekeeping to do, technical housekeeping. So when we're done here with Dr. Bredesen in just a moment, um, we're actually going to very shortly after that, leave the meeting and close the meeting down and do a quick tech reboot. So about five to 10 minutes after that, you'll all be able to come back in and log back in and we'll be ready to go uh, long before our 7 p.m. Eastern uh, panel starts. So just give us a break and uh, and come right back, check back in. We'll be here in a few minutes. Um, and, and that'll be great to have you back as well. That said, um, again, Dr. Bredesen, we want to thank you, Gracious, with your time, with your information. You're a stand for all of us. And uh, yes, you're bringing the future into the now for all of us. So thank you. And honestly, I can thank you up and down. But I have a feeling a whole bunch of people would like to thank you personally as well. So tech team, you can go ahead and unmute everybody. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. I learned a lot. Fantastic. Thank you so much. You're amazing.